remember the past and cherish the present. Amen, 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 and amen. I'm always blessed by the wonderful music ministry of this great church. Amen. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Uh, good evening to my Alfred Street family, to our visiting friends, and certainly to all of my brothers and sisters in Christ who are watching on the World Wide Web. I'm grateful to God this evening, and certainly to my beloved pastor, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley, and I ask you to help me to celebrate him for the gifts that he uses to, for the witness and the work that he does here at the Alfred Street Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. I thank God for Pastor Wesley, and I thank God for the opportunity that he has afforded me to be able to stand before you this evening to proclaim what thus says the Lord. I solicit your prayers, and certainly I pray that God's word will be blessed this evening and that God would be glorified and his people edified. If you have your Bibles with you this evening, I want to invite your attention to the reading of God's holy word and invite you to stand as we reverence the reading of his word from the book of Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, verses one through 10. And it reads thusly. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the, you know, the Lord your God chastens you. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, and that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will like nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And when you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Amen. I'd like you to wrap your thoughts this evening around the subject as you share it with your neighbors. Never forget why. You may go to your seats. Let us pray. Eternal and loving God, I thank you for the privilege to preach your word this evening. Clear my mine and use my mouth and again that your name be glorified and your people edified god i pray this prayer by the power of the holy spirit and in the name of jesus amen never forget why this evening we gather my understanding to celebrate with the seasoned saints ministry and the theme they have chosen is remember the past and cherish the present. 
But let me give you this disclaimer. This sermon is not just for the seasoned saints. It is for all of us. And prayerfully, it will encourage us to never forget who God is and why God does not want us to forget our past, which gives us hope for a brighter future. I would dare say we all have some wonderful memories of our past. We remember those high school proms, the graduations, our career journey, the class reunions, the CIAA tournaments, and weddings, and the birth of beautiful children, fabulous vacations taken at home and abroad. And yes, when we look at those old photo albums, we remember when. The past has a way of reminding us where we've been and just how far we've come by the grace and the glorious hand of God. And it is the joyous memories, church, that we never want to forget. However, there are those painful memories that we would like to erase from our subconscious. But for what a reason, there are those who indulge in the morbid memory. They live among the sorrows of the past and haunts its graves. These are they who are all too familiar with the great illnesses and minor ailments of their lives and date every event by some misfortune that happened in the same year or week. There is nothing they love more than to tell us in circumstantial detail of all of the unpleasant, terrible, tragic things that have happened since the last time we met. But if we would be truthful tonight, some of us know that we have difficulty letting go of those painful memories. And perhaps I should admit that there have been times that I've been guilty. And like those misfortunate memory events, all of us should remember the mistakes we have made in the past and pray that they will never occur again. How disappointing to remember commitments we had made but never fulfilled. And our hearts must ache having to remember the dangerous paths we've traveled. Oh yes, in disobedience to God. And yet God time and time again looked past our faults and saw our needs. And that's why I would ask us tonight to allow our memories to encourage us and move us to action. That is to have a trusting faith in God that we will that he will move us to a better place in life with him and with, with others. Never forget why. But beloved, there are some events that have taken place over the last 400 years that should also be etched forever in our memory. It is so easy to forget when we have not experienced firsthand the knocks and the bruises of life that our foreparents experienced in the wilderness of slavery life and otherwise. But I stop by this evening to let you know whether a season sank or not, we should never forget the slave era and the middle passage of brutality that our people endured. But let me refresh your memory for just a few moments if you don't mind. Many of our ancestors a hundred or so years ago by law, they were not privileged to learn to read or write. But so many of them had a heart's desire that they would go in hiding to meet with someone to teach them, knowing that if they got caught, that their fingers could be cut off or their entire hand at the risk, and even a hot iron could be placed on their face. This is the risk they took just to have a chance to read. And church, we don't know how blessed we are. And some of these individuals were our grandparents, our great-grandparents, or other relatives, and folks we don't even know. But they sacrificed much so that we could have better opportunities than what they had. Don't ever forget why. Think, if you will, about the generation of our ancestors who came out of the chateau slavery. They didn't have very much, but they took the little they did have. They prayed over it and asked God to multiply it and make it much. And with such they had, they took the monies and they built Christian kindergartens. 
Drama schools, high school, colleges, Will Ford and peer review. They built Howard University, Morehouse and Spelman. Uh, four parents built over 100 historically and contemporarily black colleges and universities. But they did not build these schools for themselves. They were mostly an illiterate generation. But they built these schools for a generation they would not see, whose voices they would not hear. But they knew they would come. Yes, we did come. And we're here tonight, seasoned saints and others remembering the past and cherishing the present. Never forget why. Yes, we remember the lynchings in the South. We remember the sit-ins and some of us took part in. We look back and we remember how we had to drink from the water fountain, lay book colored only, and enter stores through the back doors. Yes, I remember riding that old yellow school bus over 100 miles a day for five long years to earn a high school diploma. But yet I passed two high schools on my way to high school but I could not attend those schools. And yet students today live within walking distance, five blocks can get on a bus, and some can't get to school on time any day of the week. I understand that some of the seasoned saints of Alexandria walked into the district to attend school. We've come, yes, we have a mighty long way. We have not always worn, we have, let me refresh your memory though, we have not always lived in the suburbs with irrigation systems in our yards. There was a time when our four parents and parents didn't have running water or electricity in the home, and this I know for myself. There was a time when we used to have a detached garage behind the house or no garage at all. Now we have two and three car garages and a car in each one. We've not always worn designer shoes and clothes, but now we have more than enough to pull from the closet. And oftentimes we can't make up our minds as to what we should wear. But I can remember when I had to wear hand-me-downs from the white families where my grandmother did domestic work. I remember that we have not always been privileged to eat or sleep at the Ritz Carlton. And now you and I can sleep and eat wherever our money can afford. We ought to remember we are where we are today because of where God has brought us from yesterday. We ought to cherish the present and remember the past. One scholar has suggested that memory is important for our mental and spiritual growth. And the book of Deuteronomy is full of suggestions about the use of memory, about the kind of things we ought to remember and the purpose for which we ought to remember them. Deuteronomy also consists of a series of speeches which were delivered orally, no doubt, and which were written down for posterity. But it was Moses that God assigned to deliver these speeches to the children of Israel. And besides Moses, only two men, Joshua and Caleb, were still alive, who had stood at Mount Sinai as adults when God originally made a covenant with the Israelites. And the rest of the grown men and women from 40 years before had died, church, in the wilderness because of their rebellion. And when this second address was delivered, the children of Israel were encamped on the outskirts of the promised land, which they had not yet entered. But they wandered in the desert for nearly 40 years. Why? They wandered because of their unfaithfulness because of their disobedience to God and of their fear of the inhabitants in the land. And after the rebellious and unfaithful generation of the Israelites had died, God called a new generation of Israelites 
to prepare them to enter the promised land. But there was a stipulation for their entrance into the promised land, and that was simply they had to renew the covenant with him that was made with their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can you imagine God had made a promise that he would give the Israelites the land of Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey, after redeeming them from slavery in Egypt. He promised to be their God and to adopt them as his people. And all God wanted them to do was to be obedient to the laws spoken to them while they were stationed at Mount Sinai, the laws of the Decalogue, simply the laws of the Ten Commandments. It was Moses' goal to get the people to renew the covenant made at Mount Sinai. That is to make a fresh commitment to the Lord because God wanted them to enter the promised land, conquer its inhabitants, and then live in prosperity and peace. So why did the Israelites wander in the wilderness for nearly 40 years? What can we learn that will aid and assist us when we find ourselves wandering in the wilderness of life. The text says that God wanted to humble his people. Humility is one of the great Christian virtues, one of the fruit of the spirit found in Galatians 5. To be humble means to not to be proud or arrogant. Here they were about to gain instant prosperity in their new land. And you and I know that there is always a danger that is inherent in prosperity. For when a person prospers, he tends to forget God. And God didn't want the Israelites to forget where they had come from or how they had arrived in the promised land. God did not want them to feel that when they entered the promised land that they were better than the other nations around them and that their success and prosperity was a result of their own doing. God wanted them to obey the commandments he had given Moses on top of Mount Sinai. He wanted them not to worship idol gods and forget him, but rather, as Jesus said, love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, your soul, and with all of your strength. God knew that once they left Mount Sinai, they would ever so quickly forget and forsake him. You know the old adage, out of sight, out of mind. It happens to some of us when we come to church. But as soon as we leave, we forget why we came to worship in the first place. We forget what God expects from us all week long. But God said to Moses, oh, that they had such a heart that they would fear me and always keep my commandments. Bringing them out of the wilderness was not just about the physical blessings, but also, more importantly, the spiritual blessings. God wanted them to remain humble and not to become arrogant when their cupboards were full and when their cattle had increased and they had fields filled with wheat and barley, fruit of grapes and figs, all from the olive trees and honey. And when they had homes they had not built, God wanted them to have a grateful heart for all that he had promised their ancestors that he would give to them. But I just believe all that the Lord is trying to speak in our spirit tonight is that we ought not to be arrogant when we think we have arrived. Arrogant mean making unwarranted claims to be of a superior importance. But let me give you an aside for free. You might have more than the person sitting next to you tonight, but that does not mean that God loves you any more than the person next to you. The old adage is everybody is somebody and Jesus Christ is Lord. And I just wish some of those folks campaigning for the White House could learn that. You see, some may be worth billions of dollars, but what difference does it make if you only have 10 cents worth of common sense? <laughs> Arrogance will get you nowhere. 
with the Lord. And while I do not know what God wants to do with your life, I just believe God wants to use your life to make a difference wherever you are. And maybe your memory even now is taking you back to some awful mistakes you've made in your life. Well, know this, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And God can still use you if you're willing to humble yourself and willing to, to be used by him. There may be another whose memory is fresh with the thought, I've not obeyed God in the past. Well, know that it's never too late to repent and turn your life around and you can start right now obeying God. Maybe you think that your heart is too full of immorality, malice, and hate. But the God that we serve is a God of love and God give, can give you a new heart. If you would but cry out as David, who said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Maybe fresh in your memory is the fact that your life is broken, battered, and bruised. But know that Jesus Christ's life was broken, battered, and bruised. But that did not stop him from saying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Not my will, but thy will be done. He humbled himself so that God's plan and purpose for our salvation could be fulfilled in his life when he hung on that old rugged cross at Golgotha's hill and he shed his blood and made atonement for our sins. Remember the past and cherish the present. Why did they wander in the wilderness for nearly 40 years? Yes, to humble them, but secondly, to teach and to test them. You see, all students do not learn on the same level. I used to be an educator, and we had students who were labeled LD. That means they had some kind of learning disability. They were required to have special teaching materials outlined and planned for them. But I, I'm convinced that all students who are labeled LD students may not be LD students. They may just need some special discipline uh, to get on the right track. And as I've given prayerful consideration somewhere along the way, I just believe some of the Israelites had to be labeled special because they had some learning disabilities. They could not follow or did not want to follow what had been outlined for them in the special IPs designed by God, which was God's covenant to be in right relationship with them. And there were only three things that they had to learn, and they're the same three things that God wants us to learn in keeping the covenant. That's simply number one, God wanted them to be obedient to the laws that he'd given Moses. God wanted them to fear him, not that they wanted them to be afraid. That fear means reverence of him. And God wanted them to love him with all of their heart. God was trying to teach them and us that there are certain things you must learn about me if you want me to lead you all the way. Moses had to remind this generation that God had something better for them in the future, but God wanted to be sure they were restored and ready. He had led them through the wilderness, but suffice to say, they were always grumbling and complaining. In fact, some of them wanted to go back to Egypt, where they could eat leeks and onions and roasted lamb and fruits. They could not remember how many battles God had fought for them. They couldn't remember how he had fed them with heavenly manna. Yeah. They couldn't remember how their clothes never wore out and their feet didn't swell. They couldn't remember that he led them with a cloud by day and a fire by night. They couldn't remember. And yet the Israelites had been led through the wilderness. And this was the great fact of their journey. And it's the fact beyond all others and that they are now commanded to remember. Thou shalt remember all the way because it's the way by which the Lord God has led thee. The Lord has led you not just part of the way in your life, church, but all the way. 
never forget the God we serve. He doesn't lead from behind. The Lord does not lead just halfway, but the Lord leads us all the way. For the Bible says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And I like what the hymn writer says. He says, where he leads me, I will follow. I will follow. I will go with him all the way. But know that disobedience to the Lord will cause us sometimes to go our own way. And, and our worry, church, can lead to death and ultimately our failure to reach the promised land. I don't know who I'm speaking to tonight, but there may be just one or two folk in the house who know that you've been wandering in the wilderness and you can't seem to reach the promised land. Could it be, church, that God is trying to teach you and test your readiness to move on? Just maybe God wants to know if you can handle a new position if he gives it to you. Will you be able to show up and show out when the time is right? And will you let your wilderness experience be a testimony to God's goodness in your life such that others will want to draw near to him? Will God get the glory when he brings you out? Or will you take credit for whatever victory or success comes your way? This is the very reason that some folk find themselves wandering in the wilderness, not for 40 years, but all of their life, because they fail to obey God's commandments and they can't see the divine hand of God taking care of them and moving upon their lives. And so like the Israelites, they just keep grumbling and complaining about what they do not have. But they fail to realize is this fact. What they do not have is enough faith to trust God and to take him at his word. For Proverbs uh, four, five, and six, or four, five, and six tells us, five, is that right, Pastor? Tells us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will what? Direct your path. You have got to remember the past and cherish the present. In Acts 9, we learn how God had to teach and test Paul, who persecuted the church. It was not until Paul had a personal encounter with the Lord on that Damascus road, and he saw this heavenly bright light. And God blinded him for a moment, but when the blindness were taken off and he heard the voice, he said, who is it? And God said, it is I. And then Paul answered, Lord, what will thou have me to do? I simply say sometimes the Lord will teach us and test us by knocking us down before he picks us up again. The Lord wants us to remember our past and to cherish our present, never forget why. But thirdly, remember that deliverance gives us hearts of gratitude, strengthens our faith, and gives us the courage to go on. The Israelites had so much to be thankful for. Go back when you have chance and read the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy in its entirety. And likewise, we have so much to be thankful for. But whatever the wilderness experience that you're going through, whether it's a bad relationship, a divorce, a mountain of debt, wayward children, addiction abuse, depression, mental or physical abuse, a job you hate, God still wants you to have a heart of gratitude for him. And whatever we find ourselves going through, God says, have faith in me to see you through. I dare say that one of these or all of these believers who went down into the pool tonight, they remember their past and will always cherish the now, knowing that they are now new creatures in Christ Jesus. Each, I'm sure, has much to be thankful for. A lot of folk prayed for them to come to this day. And I believe that they'll remember this day in years to come and thank God for the right now. 
And if you were present a few Sundays ago when Sister Maggie Butler was blessed to celebrate her 95th birthday, I believe you would better understand what it means to have a heart of gratitude. Pastor Wesley invited her to the pulpit and she stood up in the strength of God and graced herself right on up here in this pulpit. And she thanked God and she thanked her family and she thanked the friends, she thanked Pastor Wesley and everyone who had helped her to celebrate 95 years. But anyone who knows Maggie Butler knows that she came here north from Georgia with her husband, Deacon Butler, and her three children. So she knows something about the watermelon patches, the peach orchards. She knows something about the cotton fields and the farms. But yet, she's still a humble woman who still shows gratitude and love for God by worshiping here in this place. God has been good to her. And she remembers the wilderness of the past and she treasures the present. It's only when we can remember our bitter past that we can be delivered from the load we carry. And if we will humble ourselves, God will deliver us from self-pity. I believe God will exalt us. God will use us. God will be with us if we give God thanks, honor, and glory. But church, I have to give my own testimony. For, for I have experienced my own wilderness. But I thank God who brought me out. When I look back over my past, I, I will not complain. But you see, my life hasn't always been a bed of roses. There were times like Paul when I had many thorns in my flesh. Yes, I already told you that I wore hand-me-down clothes from the white families where my grandmother did domestic work. But I was also, that you don't know, I was physically and mentally and uh, battered and abused. But yet, here I stand today. I tell you that I, yes, had been appointed and had been announced that I would become the assistant principal of a high school. But three hours later, that decision was rescinded and given to a white woman. But yet, I'm not bitter because I thank God for my past and where God has brought me to. You see, I remember what God has done in my life, but many of us are too proud to talk about our past because we don't want folk to know us when. We want them to know us now. But church, it was the when that has helped to shape my now. It was when I was down that God gave me strength and the faith to trust him in all things. It was the when of my sickness that I prayed and God answered my prayers. It was the win of my own iniquities that God shook and shaped me into the kind of woman of God that he wanted to me to be. It was the win that I did not know Jesus for myself, that God directed me by his GSP. That is God's plan of salvation for my life. It was the win. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shores, but very deeply time within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me, and when nothing else could help, it was love lifting me. It was the wind of my life that causes me to stand now with faith in a God that I know is real. It was the wind I didn't know which way to go that God took my hand and guided me all the way to Alfred Street Baptist Church. It was the wind of my life that I just wanted to give up. But God said, how can you give up when I have a promised land for you? I don't know about you, but you ought to know why. 
It's why it's because God loves us and God doesn't want us to wander in the wilderness of sin. God has a promised land that no one else can prepare. It's the promised land where he is and we shall eternally be with him. Humble yourselves. Know that he wants to teach and test you. Know that he will strengthen your faith so that you can be encouraged to go on to the promised land. Thank you.